Hi everyone, I'm just going to wait a little minute before starting the uh, webinar to give all of our participants a chance to join. Um, so I'll just pause for a minute before we start the session. Okay, I'm conscious of time and we've got an incredible uh, agenda to get through in this session. So I'm going to start now, but I'm conscious that we'll have colleagues joining as, as we're in the first part of, of uh, today's session. So welcome everybody. My name's Nancy, my pronouns are she and her. I'm the Chief Executive Stonewall. I'm incredibly excited to be here as part of today's Out and Equal conference. And so many thanks to the Out and Equal team for putting on such an incredible event. Um, you can probably see the chat box. We're going to try and leave some time for questions and answers at the end. So please, if you've got questions as we're talking, uh, leave them there and we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. And just a reminder before we start that we don't tolerate hate speech of any kind on this platform. And so hate speech that gets shared will cause the session to come to an early close. So why do we want to bring this topic to the forum? The anti-gender and anti-trans movement is growing globally. It profoundly affects LGBTQ plus people all around the world. It's important that we raise awareness of how the movement attacks LGBTQ plus rights and specifically how it attacks the rights of trans people to live freely and in safety. And we want to share our experience and encourage all of you to reflect and share strategies for responding and mitigating the negative impacts of the movement. And in particular, share strategies for supporting trans employees, friends, family and community members. So over the next 60 minutes, I'll first give an overview of the global anti-gender movement and its history and a little bit of colour about the way in which the movement expresses itself in the UK. We'll be speaking with Nyoka, a trans rights activist and executive committee member at La Federación Estatal de Lesbianas, Gays, Trans y Bisexuales, an LGBTQ plus organisation in Spain who work directly to support employers on developing inclusive workplaces. And then I'll pass to Stonewall's Head of Trans Inclusion, Kieran Metcalf, who'll give an overview of how the movement affects trans people in the UK and share insights on how global employers can ensure trans colleagues are supported. And then, as I've said, hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to start by sharing a brief history really about the origins of this movement. Globally, the anti-gender movement has a very broad ideological base. It's a movement that is focused on attacking LGBTQ plus people's rights and also women's rights, using arguments about things like natural justice or science, as well as arguments about freedoms of religion and expression. And the contemporary movement and its ideology is really deeply rooted in a backlash against mid-1990s UN-led initiatives that really pushed forward on women's rights and sexual and reproductive health. Originally, that backlash was very much centred on religious actors, and in particular the Catholic Church. And the ideas of the early anti-gender movement gained a lot of traction from the early 2000s in, 2000s in the American religious right. They became quite prevalent across right-wing European groups in the mid-2010s and have gained a lot of ground in places like Latin America over the, the last kind of 10 years. And although the anti-gender movement now extends well beyond religious institutions and organizations, the way that the thinking and the ideology developed within the church continues to shape the debates about sex and gender that we find ourselves having today. So today, there are kind of some key themes in anti-gender thinking within the church. 
Um, I'm going to talk here a bit about some ideas that come from the Congregation for Catholic Education. Um, these, these ideas are important because you can see the way in which they're reflected across the whole of the movement, whether it's secular or religious organisations. So the first theme is the idea that there is a distinction between what gets called gender theory and what gets called, probably more familiar to people on the call, gender ideology. So in this way of thinking, gender theory is um, defined as focusing on the discrimination, abuse and violence uh, that LGBTQ plus people experience and is seen as a kind of somewhat legitimate way of viewing the world. But in contrast, gender ideology, which gets talked about a lot globally, is defined in this way of thinking as focusing on education and legal instruments, human rights instruments. And I'm going to quote here because it's quite a powerful quote. And the quote is that promote ideas of personal identity and effective intimacy that make a radical break with actual biological difference between male and female. So you might think here about trans identities and that, that the idea of gender ideology treats trans identities as completely invalid. But you might also think about um, cis, lesbian, gay, bi people. So my relationship as a lesbian is, is, is also considered to kind of undermine these, these perceived actual differences between uh, male and female. And gender ideology is seen as totally illegitimate within that kind of anti-gender movement. And the reason that argument really matters is because it creates a story in which people within the anti-gender movement can present themselves as supporting LGBTQ plus rights and communities whilst arguing for things that harm us. The second theme to point to is the very persistent use, sometimes selective use, sometimes sort of fraudulent use of scientific arguments to undermine um, the rights of women and LGBTQ plus people. And you can see that when we think about anti-trans movements. Um, in the misuse of, of, of lots of, of research studies, a really key one is by an academic called Cecilia Gene, and it's used to, um, I guess, as evidence of the idea that trans woman, women are dangerous. It's not what the study shows at all. And in fact, the academic has spent years publicly saying it's not what the study shows. And yet it's probably the most commonly cited study, uh, certainly one of the most commonly cited studies in the UK around the anti-trans anti-gender movement and that kind of selective science and pseudoscience matters because it creates a story in which people within the anti-gender movement seem rational and sensible and kind of evidence-based and human rights defenders and individual LGBTQ plus people seem ideological and radical and it also creates a space in which people in politics or the media wider public life can be quite openly trans transphobic but do it under the guise of science and the third theme that I would point to is that the movement really prioritizes law as an arena to confront and resist LGBTQ plus rights so you can see that for instance in the wave of anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ plus legislation that has swept across the UK or the use of anti-trans litigation here and in a number of countries and that theme matters because it enables taking forward kind of very tactical actions without ever society sort of stepping back and screwing scrutinizing what are the wider impacts. So since the 90s, the movement has been evolving and growing, moving through neoconservative movements in Latin America, the religious right in, and conservative secular institutions in the UK, in the USA rather, and particularly in the UK, um, we have a form of anti-trans organizing that crosses left-right boundaries in the form of gender critical feminism. And the UN independent expert on SOGESC has taken up this issue so powerfully because it goes to the heart of how we engage with the rights and dignity of LGBTQ plus people. And he calls on governments to proactively support all LGBTQ plus communities and ensure that they adopt a policy of zero tolerance towards those who seek to entrench exclusion and inequality. And that leadership from the UN and from member states is of vital importance here because the anti-gender movement is a very powerful force around the world. 
So today, the movement is well-funded, well-coordinated across traditional lines of engagement. So multi-faith, faith and secular, conservative, um, even far-right organizations working with left-wing feminist organizations. And it's well-networked, particularly in elite audiences. It's also highly adaptive. So in some countries, the anti-gender movement advances regressive policy that is across both women's rights and LGBTQ plus rights. So you might think here of countries like Hungary or to a degree Poland. You might think of the work of organizations like Family Watch International, which for over a decade funded through the US evangelical movement has trained uh, religious civil society and political leaders to oppose sexuality, education and LGBTQ rights across Africa. But in other countries, and you might think here of the UK, a lot of the positions that are held by the anti-gender movement are considered much less socially acceptable. And in those countries, the focus of organising and action is on campaigning against trans people's rights and their ability to kind of live in dignity. But it's important that the consequences of that anti-trans organising often flow across groups. And a great example of that is in Turkey and the decision of Turkey to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention. And that's a convention that combats violence against women and girls. But the withdrawal was justified on the basis that its provisions on domestic abuse had been used to uh, advance uh, the rights of, quote unquote, homosexuals and clashed with family values. And a consistent feature of the movement is the degree to which the trans community, globally one of the most marginalised community, is used as a thin end of the wedge. And by dividing the rights of LGBTQ plus people and straight cis women, and then further dividing LGBTQ plus cis people and the trans community, the movement is able to pursue those broader anti-gender goals through a kind of staged approach. So as the CEO of a UK based LGBTQ plus human rights organization, I wanted to just share some headlines of what the movement looks like here where, where we are. So in the UK, anti-gender views most commonly manifest as specifically and profoundly anti-trans. The most visible advocates for anti-trans positions identify themselves often as feminist organisations rather than traditionalist or populist organisations as they are in other countries. Uh, but it's important to note that all groups, including um, religiously conservative groups, more traditional right wing groups, use pro LGB and feminist sort of signals to justify a transphobic agenda. So this creates quite a strange situation where you might have um, people that have lobbied against equal marriage, that have lobbied against uh, the, the right to adopt and form a family, talk publicly about worry, being worried about um, protecting lesbians when, when they've not really shown any sign of, uh, of wanting to protect lesbians in the past. So the signalling is quite similar, even in the more conservative institutions. The movement's made up of quite a dense network of small organisations with minimal governance and a considerable overlaps, both in terms of the leadership and the membership. And in almost all cases, the footprint of the supporters is primarily digital. And money flows in from major donors, monthly dues, crowdfunding, as well as from some institutional granting, often from funders who don't fully understand the organization's activities. Um, US funders support directly, but they also uh, channel money via the public crowdfunding uh, approaches. And the UK anti-gender movement focuses on legislative change campaigns with a very strong elite influencing model. And it's been both a key driver of creating and also a key kind of exploiter of the UK's very unbalanced media environment. So our media is um, obsessed with reporting on trans people and, and the vast majority of that reporting is, is transphobic and imbalanced. They've got a significant program of crowdfunded strategic litigation and use threats of litigation to great effect. So a lot of schools have been threatened with litigation and as a consequence have withdrawn um, resources that are about LGBTQ inclusion in schools. And they, they operate online quite a coordinated trolling machine. So anyone in the public eye who says anything positive about trans people will have days and days and days of trolling. 
There's also a lot of online radicalization with very concentrated misinformation and disinformation taking people down anti-trans rabbit holes. They attack LGBTQ human rights defenders, particularly individual trans activists, and they attack uh, LGBTQ organizations, particularly Stonewall. So in the UK, it's a stated goal of the anti-gender movement to shut our organization down. Most importantly, the impact on the trans community has been devastating. We are absolutely going backwards in terms of the lived experience of trans people in the UK. We have data that shows trans people feel less safe at work than they did a few years ago. We know transphobic hate crime is rising and multiple studies have shown that this really adverse context has caused big deterioration in the mental health of the trans community. And we've become exporters. So the tactics and narratives and stories of the anti-trans movement in the UK are now visible in the left-oriented gender critical feminism um, emerging in places like Spain. And a lot of the US anti-trans bills and court cases use UK arguments or UK court cases. So now in the UK, we're struggling to counter some embedded ideas, like the embedded idea that women's rights are in, and trans rights are in tension, when of course they're not. And that has a, a range of current and potential future um, implications for us. We carry a real risk of weakening human rights protections around access to gendered spaces, around access to healthcare. We carry risk of rolling back wider LGBTQ plus protections and protections for women and girls. So one of the main anti-trans lawsuits actually attacked Gillick competency, which is the basis on which um, you can access reproductive health, including abortion in the UK. And I think it's just important to say that we know LGBTQ plus rights don't follow a rainbow arc of ever more inclusive societies. You know, if we want our societies to be more inclusive, particularly of our trans siblings, we need to make them that way. And we also know from all of our work over three decades that global businesses can lead transformation and, and lead the way to a world where LGBTQ plus people are free and equal. So the solidarity of the community and out and equal is more important than ever. So a few brief things that you might want to think about as employers. You should really think about the impact of this external environment on your employees' well-being. This is exhausting, it is frightening, it is frustrating, and, and, and it is for all LGBTQ plus people, but particularly for the trans community. And, and it goes well beyond the workforce, the workplace. So really important to be mindful of that as an employer. It's good to think about really nurturing collaboration between network groups that have historically been allies for each other. It's the exception rather than the rule, but we have seen employee resource groups that focus on LGBTQ employees and women develop more fractious relationships. And we know that that strong intersectional working needs to be nurtured. Office spaces may be or may feel less secure particularly for trans colleagues. So from our 2018 research, we know that 12% of trans people have been physically attacked in the workplace. And we need to think about physical safety, but also psychological safety. So employers need to be really clear about their commitment to trans inclusion. And we need to think about the potential of attacks on human rights defenders and, for, and your partners. So we've seen this in the UK, you know, organizations that are explicitly trans inclusive will come under attack. And that means your valued partners will come under attack. So you should be ready to stand by them and articulate your own values around trans inclusion and LGBTQ inclusion as a whole with confidence. So I hope that was a helpful introduction to the anti-gender movement globally. And we know that our UK experience is not an isolated one. We've got really strong relationships with LGBTQ plus organizations around the world. And I'm so excited to say that today we're joined by Nyerka from La Federación in Spain, an LGBTQ organization with a fantastic workplace inclusion program and a program that specifically uh, supports employers in hiring trans employees called Yes We Trans. So welcome Nyerka. And could you start perhaps by giving us a brief introduction to yourself and your role? Camino, no sé si tú me vas a traducir, ¿no? Camino. 
y empieza hablando y yo te traduzco. Pues yo soy Niurka, soy de la Federación Estatal de Lesbianas, Gays, Trans y Bisexuales de aquí de España. Eh, My name is Niurka. La... I am from the Federation of Lesbian, Gay, Transsexuals and Bisexuals in Spain. Formo parte de la Comisión Ejecutiva y en este momento del proyecto Yes We Trans, que es un proyecto eh, pionero de inserción laboral para personas trans en España. I am involved with the program Yes We Trans here in Spain. I am part of the executive member of this program. And can you tell us about how you have seen the anti-gender movement develop in Spain? How have you seen, uh, como has visto el, el movimiento um, el de, de, de aceptación de trans en, en España, Niurka? ¿De aceptación o de antigénero? ¿Cuál es la pregunta? Um, Nancy, is, is it um, the situation of trans people as the face discrimination or is it how is, is the program helping them? accepted sorry i misunderstood your question it's it's a question about um the anti-trans organizations and the work that they do in spain and um, kind of to attack trans rights um, las organizaciones que se um, que están contra los derechos de los trans en españa y las cosas que hacen sí. Yo creo que en España hemos tenido un aumento de, de estos discursos eh, antifeministas y de, extremo, de extrema derecha. Hay un I aumento believe, de... I believe that we have had an increase in number of organizations, feminist organizations and anti-trust organizations in Spain with estos this, with this estos, topic. Estos discursos se hacen peligrosos porque sobre todo provienen ya no de cualquier persona, eh, sino de muchas personas eh, con cierto poder político, académico eh, e incluso desde una reflexión filosófica, teórica, aquí en nuestro país. This, this, the danger thing that is happening in Spain at the moment is that these discourses, this, this uh, dialogue, as it were, is coming from people who are academically gifted and, and powerful and is starting um, a, ten, a tendency to, to, to be listened to. Este, estos discursos han creado un miedo, un rechazo y una incertidumbre en la población, sobre todo cuando estas mujeres, voy a decir así, de este ámbito académico y filosófico, hablaron del borrado de las mujeres. Hablaron del... ¿De qué? Perdona, Niurka, no. Borrado de las mujeres. ¿Qué es el borrado? Tú dilo, porque lo van a entender. Ok. Um, what I have experienced is these women, and it would seem to be women, and I would call them women, um, have created an, an increase, an unprecedented element of fear and rejection of what is known as Borrado women, um, possibly null out women. One can translate that as, I don't know if the concept borrado means anything to the rest of you, but that's the concept that New York is using. So, cuestionaron también eh, el proyecto de ley transestatal que se está realizando, haciendo referencia de que es una ideología de género, que es una manipulación de los niños trans por incitación por parte de los adultos. Este tipo de discursos además han creado mucha división en nuestra sociedad. Um, they also um, intervened in, 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 in the law that is currently being, being looked into, uh, in Spanish uh, trans law, and they question um, the validity of it. Um, Yes. Un ejemplo, sigue, sigue. Nancy, Nancy, do you want to? So, what are the, the challenges that it presents you as a trans activist, the Federación? What are the challenges of kind of fighting back against this movement? 
¿Cuáles son los retos para luchar contra estos, um, estas dificultades, Niurka? Sí, yo creo que uno de los desafíos principales es conseguir la aprobación de la ley trans estatal y de no discriminación del colectivo LGTBI plus en España. What um, I hope is that um, the law gets approved and passed in the in the in here in the UK. I was about to say sorry. In in Spain, the trans law, which is which is being looked into. And that would be an asset to the situation to fight these, these present uh, predicaments. Que se haga real el pacto eh, contra los discursos de odio que se está promoviendo entre el gobierno y los colectivos LGTBI+. That there is an agreement to accept um, the reality of the trans community and between the different um, units of, of, of the political sphere. Fortalecer las relaciones entre los colectivos feministas de mujeres con los colectivos LGTBI+, donde también existimos mujeres trans, para que podamos hablar de este, de este lenguaje trans inclusivo e interseccional. Um, to strengthen the relationship between feminist groups, women only feminist groups, as it were, and, and trans organizations, so that this relationship could be enhanced, could be improved, could be dismystified. Que sigamos teniendo esta firmeza y esta convicción en la defensa de los derechos humanos liderando muchísimos espacios sociales y políticos que se nos quieren arrebatar. You have this conviction, conviction, this, 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 this belief um, uh, to, to defend human rights um, to all and that we could defend the, the, the space of, of people in the public and the private sphere. Seguir fortaleciendo los te el tejido internacional con organizaciones europeas, ILGA, Transgender Europe, apostar por la estrategia 2030 eh, con Latinoamérica también. Work together with international organizations, like-minded organizations, um, and the 2030 project with, with other international um, organizations, as well as with, um, with other continents like um, South, South America, Central America, North America. Y por último, promover la inclusión del colectivo trans en el ámbito laboral y lo estamos haciendo con el programa Yes We Trans. And finally, to keep on promoting the inclusion of, of people, trans people in, in the workforce with the value they, they can offer. So that's a really fantastic lead in to my next question, which is how do we support trans family, friends, co-workers? What does what should people be doing to be good allies to the trans community right now? Um so um it's um lo que has dicho sigue muy bien la pregunta que te quiero hacer. ¿Cómo podemos apoyar um, a la comunidad trans, a, además de a la comunidad, uh, a la familia de la comunidad trans, a las personas um, trans, directa y directamente? ¿Cómo se puede ser? ¿Cómo se puede ser qué? Un aliado positivo, una aliada. ¿Cómo se puede trabajar? Hay que decir, eh, antes, como cuando se hablaba de la familia, eh, que según una encuesta internacional, YouGov, de agosto del 2021, los españoles, las España se convierte en uno de los primeros países que acoge a las, a las familias, a las familias ¿no? en general al colectivo LGTBI+. Eh, que es una pregunta que se hace, eh, ¿qué grado de apoyo tendrían los británicos eh, para el colectivo LGTBI+, y España sale... Eh, 
liderando este apoyo, ¿no? Según estas encuestas, que esto es importante decir también. Um, according to um, a, a Gov.uk um, um, survey, it would seem that Spain came up top when <coughs> when he when when it came to the issue of LGBT and, and families, even above um, what it would seem the UK is doing. And that's important to point out, the 2021 survey. Cuando a mí me preguntan sobre cómo ser un buen aliado de la comunidad trans, yo siempre digo, conozcan nuestras historias, escuchen nuestras voces. When I'm asked how to be an, an ally of the trans people, trans family, trans community, I always say the same thing. Do get to know our, ourselves, do get to know our history, do get to know us, us, us who we are. As, as people. Ser un buen, sigue, sigue. And, and how should um, employers, how should workplaces be kind of taking action right now, Nyerka? Um, la pregunta es, ¿cómo deberían los empresarios, la gente de trabajo, um, a, a hacerlo diferentemente para aceptar otro tipo de empleados? Creo que en una empresa, eh, la alta dirección, quienes toman decisiones, tienen una gran responsabilidad si queremos cambiar estructuras, eh, digamos, muy cerradas o clásicas a estructuras más abiertas y diversas. Eso es lo primero. I believe, first and foremost, the top executive within these organizations, the ones at the top, ought to be having a more open-minded act attitude towards who they employ. Uh, it has to come from the top, first and foremost. Creo que en muchas empresas se desconoce la realidad de las personas trans, por eso creo que como segunda cosa importante es formación específica, recursos humanos y sensibilización a toda la plantilla sobre la realidad trans. Um, en mi opinión, creo que muchas. Uh, en inglés. En inglés. Uh, oh, sorry. En mi opinión, in my, in my opinion, I beg your pardon. It is, it is, it is late. In my opinion, it is, it is, um, it is a fact that it is not known um, the the realities of of the trans community um, at at any level within the workplace and. What I would say, the second thing I would say, is to do with um, training and to bring about a, great, a greater awareness to the trans people, the trans community, and the value they have to offer. Y creo que también es crear eh, protocolos eh, de no discriminación contra el colectivo LGTBI+. Eh, crear herramientas, lineamientos que nos permitan hacer que las personas trans se sientan incluidas dentro de la empresa. I also believe that it would be useful, positive, practical to create policies that would, LGTB policies that truly um, bring about um, a sense of inclusion that these people feel they're included. Y también que las empresas deben trabajar eh, de la mano con los colectivos LGTBI+, para fortalecer la diversidad dentro de la empresa. I also believe it's extremely important that businesses work hand in hand with LGBT organizations so that a stronger uh, relationship that allows a great understanding would benefit the entirety of, of the LGBT plus community. Y de manera más, más concreta, eh, los trabajadores creo que pueden ser eh, agentes también de inclusión desde el respeto, desde la educación, desde la inclusión, desde el lenguaje inclusivo. Um, I also believe that the, 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 the worker, um, the, the average Bob, um, 
could could be an, an agent of transformation to allow this inclusion to be a reality in the workplace. Un claro ejemplo, y con esto termino, es que Yes We Trans es el primer programa que está abriendo puertas con las empresas y en el que en este momento tenemos 350 perfiles de personas trans buscando incluirse en el ámbito laboral. Um, one, one final uh, thought, and with this I conclude the point. Um, the program um, with which I'm involved, Yes We Trans, has 350 profiles um, which um, of, of people which are currently in, in considered for, for employment. Yoka, thank you so much for that. I mean, I think there's such a powerful story about trans people's kind of contribution and leadership within the workplace, about the role that colleagues can play and the role that corporate leaders can play in creating stronger inclusion. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn now and introduce my colleague, Kiran, who I'm glad has survived a, a difficult journey to be with us tonight. Um, Kiran's head of uh, trans inclusion at Stowall and is going to talk a little bit about how the context of the anti-gender movement impacts on the lived experience of trans people and practical steps that employers can take to step up and show their commitment to trans equality. Thank you, Nancy. Um, just trying to see if I'm able to control the PowerPoint. Yes, I think I am. Or no, is that you doing it? I think you're going to have to do it. Oh no, was that me, Nancy, doing that? It's Vicky. Vicky will do it for oh, you. Vicky, do the clicking. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about today is kind of looking at how healthcare, which is one of the areas that Nancy raised earlier, earlier has been really specific to the UK. So I think the easiest way to put it is um, adult trans healthcare and young people's trans healthcare. So young people um, have a different service in the UK and there's been a lot of um, legal kind of challenges to it recently. So the most, the two most important ones are the Tavistock versus Bell case, which has recently finished, and the G General Medical Council versus Dr. Webberley um, hearing, which is still going on. Um, so the Tavistock versus Bell is focused on um, a situation where someone who went into the young person services age 16 plus, um, and then into the adult services later transitioned, became a kind of a poster child for bringing on a legal case to stop the, um, young people being access, able to access medical care. Initially, the court ruled in their favour, but luckily recently, they, that ruling was overchanged. What is really interesting about this is that an anti-abortion lawyer was the key lawyer in, in the case. And going on from there, their appeal, they want to cut, um, focus on Gillick competency, which is what allows um, all young people, um, trans and cis young people, to be able to access um, medical care, such as being able to choose to go have an abortion or choosing to go on contraception aged under 16. Um, and so this is something that we often see, but something that is bad for trans people is generally also bad for women because the two aren't two separate categories. They're of course trans women um, who are often the center of these things. And so anything that is bad for trans women is generally bad for women and also all trans people. Um, with the Webberley case, that is then attacking um, private care. Um, so what we're seeing here is NHS care and private care being challenged so that it takes a full route for young people to be able to have control over their bodies. At the moment, um, GIDS referrals are coming in with a free way year wait. So they're seeing people who refer to them at 2018. So if you're getting young people referred who are needing to potentially delay their puberty, three years is too long a wait. As you can see from the quotes on the screen that um, Vicky is showing, um, this is really damaging to trans young people. You can hear their voices here saying it's so much more damaging being put through the wrong puberty um, by being denied puberty blockers than being told that they have then been told that they've done it to protect you. Um, there are people where it is a life or death situation with going on hormones. I ended up going privately because of how long it was taking, which not everyone can afford. It's going to create unnecessary dysphoria to others and it almost took my life. So I don't want anyone else to go through it. And that is from a 15 year old trans young woman that we spoke to. Um, and Ezekiel, who's the founder of the Black Trans Foundation, was talking to us about saying how there being a lack of healthcare um, is, 
it's got to the stage where basically there isn't any healthcare. The waiting list is so long that it has made all healthcare basically non-existent. So if we move on to the next slide, we can look at the impact on adult trans people and see that it is basically the same situation. A very long waiting list. Um, the waiting list at the moment is people are being seen from 2017. So that is uh, around about a four year wait, when legally with under the NHS, it should be 18 weeks. With bottom surgery, the NHS, the bottom surgery, I'll just explain is what um, trans people often refer to as genital surgery. Um, and there, that has run out of its contract and was allowed to do so for over a year. All of these things, normally you would be able to take kind of like action against and say this is actually against what the NHS has to legally hold itself to. But the problem is with anti-trans attacks on the GIC, it makes it a really tricky situation for trans people to then be able to kind of advocate for their rights because if you critique, potentially critique the GIC, you could be losing the only healthcare for you. Um, and so here's some quotes from some people that we spoke to in our adult consultations last year, where they said that NHS puts people in a position where they feel they have absolutely no choice um, other than to kind of basically take their own medical care into their own hands. Um, one person who was 18 years old told us that if they weren't on testosterone, they didn't think that they'd have been able to go to university and that they don't really think that people acknowledge how important access to hormones is. And we spoke to another person who had even been looking into self-castration and looking at self-medicating on hormones, despite there being some risks. So again, we're kind of seeing these issues and how this is going to be impacting your employees is your employees potentially aren't going to be getting the transition healthcare they need. So a really easy thing that workplaces can do to help trans employees is make sure that any healthcare, uh, health insurance um, and health schemes that you offer allow trans people to access trans specific healthcare. Many of them don't, but there are a few out there that do. If we could go on to the next slide, Vicky. Um, so the next kind of big area that kind of Nancy talked about, and I'm going to talk a bit more in detail, is gendered spaces. Again, healthcare is one of the really big ones in this, but all healthcare, so not just trans-specific healthcare, trans people need general healthcare just like anyone else. Um, what we've seen is um, from anti-gender movements, a lot of online harassment um, of services that provide healthcare or condition-specific information that is inclusive of trans people, and you will see them doing things such as um, a kind of deluge of tweets at these people and also blocking up all of their internal comms through calling their helplines and emailing in that stops them being able to actually help the people that they're there to help. Kind of two of the most recent um, examples of this are the um, Cervical Screening Trust and the Cancer Research Trust being criticised online and by media leading to a deluge of abuse but where they encouraged everyone with the cervix to get cancer screenings than, um, rather than just saying women. Now, it's really important there are non-binary, intersex and trans men who have cervixes, and it's really important that those people get those checked and know they need to get them. So expanding the language to include women, but also include anyone who has a cervix is really important for getting people to know what healthcare they need. Um, and we found that one in six trans people have been refused access to healthcare due to being trans. So... What, and you can hear, see here below a quote from Nim Ralph, who's a trans activist, um, talking about how the NHS often treats chronic health conditions where it's often really traumatic for trans people to access these services because people don't know how to engage, talk about or understand trans bodies and trans experiences. So if you are providing any additional healthcare services, um, such as even like therapy support or a online counselling that people can phone up to or a online GP. It's really important to make sure that those people have had trans awareness training because it could be trans people trying to access for any other healthcare that they will need to be using those services that your company potentially provides um, as a kind of a bonus for employees and making sure that that is in trans inclusive all the way through. If you could go on to the next slide. Another issue is community and leisure facilities. So this can include anything from kind of like sports, gyms, down to bathrooms. Um, and what we're seeing is that 38% of trans people told Stonewall that they avoid going for gym or participating in school, sport groups because of fear of discrimination. Um, and often that they are, like we have a quote here from a trans man who was saying he was playing volleyball with the men's team and was told he was not allowed to play matches unless he played with the girls team. 
And you can imagine the optics of that if the uh, man who's been on testosterone for a while is playing in the girls' team. Everyone is then going to critique him, saying it's unfair that any win he has is shows that it's an unfair advantage. So what this is actually creating is a no-win situation for trans people. Why this may be important to organisations is that, well, from two things, like often um, employees often provide a discount for gyms or a gym that is on location or near your organization's buildings. It's really important to make sure that um, the changing rooms and bathrooms there and the general atmosphere is trans inclusive, otherwise trans um, staff won't be able to engage with that and therefore they'll be getting slightly less benefits than their colleagues. It's also useful for if you're looking at when you're employing someone or taking on people who've maybe just come out of university and you've got lots of different participants and you then start thinking, well, how do we choose between these? Often a way that is a really legitimate way of deciding is to go and look at um, what extracurricular activities they did. And if you say, oh, look, there's loads of team sports on here, that shows their team player, that's good, that puts them above this other person who happens to be trans. Even though that's not intentional discrimination, it could create a situation where trans people aren't able to access employment in the same way because they aren't able to take part in team sports and are often barred from doing those sorts of extracurricular activities. Also, when thinking about bathrooms, it's really, really important to at your organisation to make sure that any function places you go to, any team away days and your um, on-site facilities are, have bathrooms that are trans inclusive. Um, and that doesn't mean just making a unisex bathroom for trans people and then saying, OK, all the cis people can use whichever bathroom they want, but the trans people just have to use this non-gendered one. Inclusive bathrooms is giving people options. There are cis people who would prefer gender neutral ones and there are trans people who would prefer to use the bathroom that um, correlates with their best gender. So here's another quote from someone who was talking to us in about 2017 saying, people are aggressively when I use public bathrooms. If they're unsure of my biological sex, people think it's acceptable to ask me about my sex and genitals in public environments. I've had people grab at my crotch in public walking down a road in the middle of the day in a crowded area. So when we're talking about safety in bathrooms, it's generally actually the safety of trans people we need to be thinking about, not the safety of cis people. Trans people aren't generally, are not a risk to cis people. Um, cis people very frequently are a risk to trans people. So looking on to the kind of last area that I think it's really important for organisations to think about is violence and abuse. So trans people experience a large amount of violence and abuse. One in five trans people have reported being offered conversion therapy. And this is a pain that can last with people for many, many years. So this is a quote from Carolyn who experienced conversion therapy in the, 90, in the early 1970s and 80s. And yet she still lives with that pain today. And she says, I still, I clearly remember the pain of those shocks and the tears that ran down my face. The doctors were convinced that if I learned to associate my gender with physical pain, I'd stop having those feelings. So this is something that one in five of your trans employees may have personally experienced or been offered. It may make them really res resistant to um, accessing therapy services because it is often within therapeutic settings that people experience conversion therapy. Also, when we're talking about survivor services, one in four trans people experienced domestic abuse from 2017 to 2018. And that's from our statistics only looking at one year. A recent Scottish survey found that 80% of trans people reported having experienced domestic violence if you looked at their whole lives. Um, and this means that trans people are often carrying a fair amount of trauma. Um, uh, and I will hurry up and move on to QAs. I've just seen a little note there telling me to hurry up. And they also experience targeted harassment with two in five people, experience, trans people experiencing hate crime. So it's really important that when you provide therapeutic services, but you're also thinking about that trans people will have experienced lots of really difficult things and be aware of that. It doesn't mean that all trans people are traumatized and have all experienced this, but it's really important to make sure that your counseling services are trans inclusive. So now I'm going to move on to the last slide of what can employers do so that we have a fair amount of time for questions and answers. So out of all those things I've messaged, um, I, what I will do is I'll say that firstly, clear and consistent messaging that trans colleagues are unconditionally supporting you. Sorry, let me repeat myself. Clear and consistent messaging that trans colleagues are unconditionally supported in your organisation and or employee networks. Number two, reissue a robust code of conduct or anti-discrimination policy that clearly outlines what transphobic behaviour is 
alongside clear and accessible guidance on how to report an issue. Uh, number three, which is labeled number four here, um, utilize the monitoring data to access pay equity and to identify any potential discrimination in the application recruitment to hire and promotions process. So that could be looking at how many trans people are applying who have chosen to disclose that to us and how many people are being employed compared. And that needs to be throughout the organization. So not just at the lower levels, but during every level up to and including CEOs and trustees. Um, be ready to stand by your external LGBT partners in the wake of a coordinated attack on trans equality and pay your senior leaders and internal comms teams to do the same because when attacks come, they come really hard. And if you don't aren't prepared, it can be really difficult. Um, of course, Stonewall is always there to help those and give advice if you do need it. Um, and the lastly, to ensure that suppliers are fully trans inclusive too, in, in, for example, employee healthcare schemes that cover trans healthcare. So thank you very much for that. And I will pass over back to Nancy for the Q&As. So we've had one, a couple of questions in the chat that are about kind of responding to circular arguments that are made and kind of persistently made, particularly online. Um, and so I'll address that uh, first, maybe. And then there's also a question around anti-trans um, rhetoric in the media. So, so um, maybe uh, Kirin, the, I'll, I'll give the first question to you and then I'll handle the UK media question, if that's all right, you and Yerka. So what, what is the best thing to do when people are making these arguments that are designed to trappers how do you how do you port to how do you change the the story that gets told about trans people so a, an iconic kind of question in but fits in this to give people who maybe haven't heard them before an idea is like the stalingrad question which is kind of like do you want to see penises and dressing in front of little girls and obviously if you say no then they're like well you're a child abuser and if you say yes then you're suggesting that trans people would do those things and that it's okay to exclude trans people. So it's a no-win question. What we find is that debating that doesn't help. So I think the how you respond differs slightly depending on the context that you reach this in. If this is just something you see online or come across in your personal life, I'd say it's always better to not engage and just instead promote trans content by trans people talking about the issues that affect trans people. If, however, it is something that's been directed at your company in a very public way, maybe it's part of a big kind of query that you've made, you've, for example, made changing rooms, um, trans inclusive, and you're getting a lot of backlash on this. The way to answer it is to not answer it as such, but to talk about what you do have. And so kind of say, this is our trans inclusion policy. Obviously, we would never want anyone on changing in front of anyone else. So we have changing rooms that have lockable doors and then talk about your self-child safeguarding policy and kind of talk about all these things and reframe it as actually it's trans people who possibly also need the safety of that and no one should be undressing in front of anyone else's children's at all. Um, and that is the kind of way to go with it. So go for the positive. These people are not arguing with you out of logic. They don't they will change the goalposts as many times as they need to win the argument. So there is absolutely nothing you can do by engaging in that argument. All you end up doing is repeating the myth to a point that it, then people think, oh, there must be some truth there. So just try not to engage and redirect towards positive things or raising trans voices. Be... Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say, just conscious of time, I would build on that about the media question. So there are... In the UK, the media is an obsessional coverer of um, trans people's lives and rights, but typically from a very negative perspective. And, uh, you know, we can think all sorts of things about how we change editorial policy over the longer term. But I think in the shorter term, making sure that the content we choose to amplify, we choose to read, we choose to share, we choose to direct people to is positive and wherever possible is created by trans people themselves. Because I think particularly on social media, there's a real opportunity for us to accidentally amplify transphobia by responding to it or repeating it or and, and kind of using our own platform to make it louder. But there's also a choice for us to amplify trans creativity, trans thinking, kind of liberation thinking, those sorts of things. So I think those two connections um, 
those two questions connect in that way. Um, we've got a question um, that I'll just answer really briefly and then I have to say thank you to everybody, sorry for my bad chairing, um, which is about pay equity monitoring and um, and kind of uh, the data that you need in order to monitor pay equity. So I think there are there are two things to think about here. There is um, uh, gender pay gap monitoring in terms of being able to um, assess the gap between all women, all men, all non-binary people in an organization. And then there is needing to understand people's self-identified trans history in order to understand if you're underpaying, overpaying, or paying the same uh, between all of your trans and cis colleagues. I think there are some really good basic approaches to gathering data, a lot of information on our site at Stonewall about that. And I, but I would also always advocate working with trans colleagues in your organization to understand what makes sense for them, particularly if you're in a multinational organization where questions will not mean the same thing internationally and will not land in the same way internationally. So I'm really sorry that we don't have more time for questions. It's entirely my responsibility and I apologize profusely. I'd be really happy to answer any questions and forward them to Kirin and Yerka outside of this message but I hope the session's been useful in understanding the the kind of history and genesis of the movement in more detail also thinking about how it's affecting communities and workplaces in Spain and in the UK and and prompting thoughts about how your own organization can and should respond and support trans colleagues so I want to really thank you to out and equal for hosting such an important global summit. We're absolutely thrilled to be working with you. I want to give enormous thanks to Nyaka. Federacion is such a fantastic organization and the work that you do around uh, employment and trans people's ability to thrive in the workplace is really inspirational to us at Stonewall and to Kirin for all of your thoughts about the ways in which organizations can be part of the solution for the trans people that work in them so thank you so much for all of um, all of your work and to our brilliant translator it's always such a pleasure to be able to have bilingual discussions and and I I'm so conscious that parallel translation is, is the trickiest thing in, in the world. And finally, thank you so much to all of the attendees. This is such an important topic and it's very, um, it's very exciting to all of us that employers like you are interested in understanding more and being aware and taking steps to support LGBTQ plus colleagues in the face of a really damaging global movement. So thank all of you for everything that you do. And I hope you have an absolute brilliant rest of your time at the Out, Out and Equal Summit.